Michael, and, and it's pertinent to what we're going to talk about, some of these artefacts, structures on the, on the moon and on Mars. You know, you've got that engineering eye, Michael, and, uh, and, and you've got that engineering consultant brain to look at this stuff from a, an educated perspective and say, no, this isn't random, this is orderly, this is, you know, this is your territory, Michael, and I see why you've done the, the, the books in that manner. Uh, I can see why you've followed on from the moon and Mars and then Mars too. There's so much information and so many photographs being discovered daily. Um, so tell us a little bit about you, Michael, where you're at today with the TV stuff and the books. And of course, you've got your new book out and we'll have a little general conversation before we get into the nitty gritty. OK, well, you know, I guess I, I, I really agree with you on that that first point about this, because, you know, you think about it and uh, most of the people that study these photographs of the moon or photographs of Mars, I mean, they're they're actually planetary geologists. In other words, they're they're rock doctors. And, you know, I'm not an architect, but I do have an engineering background, structural engineering background. And like a lot of other guys in, this, uh, in that, uh, that career, I know structure when I see it. Mm. And so when I look at these things, I can definitely see the signs of construction and intent and design intent, as opposed to, you know, somebody who studies rocks is not going to be able, they're not going to recognize that. They're going to try to come up with some ad hoc um, geologic explanation for stuff. And it really just doesn't fit for most of these things. You know, as you start digging into it deeper and deeper, you look at something like the face on Mars, for instance. It looks like a face from a long ways away. When you get up close, you see all sorts of structural detail on it, which is exactly what you'd expect if it was constructed as opposed to if it was just some sort of random geologic formation. I mean, you know, I like to joke that uh, since I'm, I'm out in Seattle right now, I like to joke that geologists can come up with a a natural explanation for the space needle on Google Earth if they had to <laughs> to make to, to claim it wasn't artificial, you know. Sure. So it's just um, as part as part of the my background. I mean, I grew up uh, in the Seattle area. I worked at Boeing for a decade and a half. I, I went on to other contract jobs. Uh, worked for a lot of other companies internationally, and and then settled in in LA and um, started doing more things on the consulting side because it was. The cool thing about it is I didn't have to produce anything. You know, I, didn't, <laughs> I didn't have to actually build any parts, design anything. Wow. I could just sit back and tell other people what to do. So that was that was the relaxing part of my career. You know, not to really have any deadlines. And, uh, and since then, you know, I've become very curious in all these with all these different um, mysteries about UFOs and aliens and things. And I think what what's always caught my eye about these extraterrestrial artifacts is the fact that you can prove it out and you can point to things that are you know, obviously structural, and you can, I think, kind of build a case that, that you've got some proof, whereas I don't think you can really prove alien abductions or or um, a lot of UFO videos are really hard to prove out. So sure. it's, you know, just, that's kind of the way I, I was attracted to this kind of stuff because it was more interesting and, and more solid, I thought. But having said that, you know, I'm involved in a new TV show called Uncovering Aliens. Oh, yeah. For the, the Animal Planet Network out here. And we're, we're doing investigations of, um, you know, UFO cases, sightings, and even abductions. And it's been a real eye-opener for me to, to have that experience and actually meet people that have gone through this stuff. Because it, 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 it's hard to sit there and look at somebody and say, you know, you're lying when they're obviously not lying. But something mm. really, really strange happened to them. And... I guess my job on the show is just to kind of make sure that that we're asking all the questions that need to be asked before we sure. come to a conclusion. And it's different to UF hunters in a way than Michael. Yeah, it, it is. It's you know the, the main thing that we've tried to focus on. We we shot four episodes initially, and we're still waiting to hear from the network. They've shown them over and over and over again. They've shown them overseas. I guess I guess we're big in Lithuania, is what I heard recently. <laughs> but uh, but they're showing them all over the place, but. They haven't committed to new episodes yet. We're kind of hoping we're going to get, get a decision on that very soon and move forward. But it's it's more of a situation where we're actually doing personal, you know, cases, abduction cases. We had one case. We had one case where we actually uh, studied uh, a piece of metal that had been shot off of a UFO that was over a guy's house. And, and we did uh, an examination of it, and there's subsequently been two more lab tests. And it came back as a non-terrestrial manufactured aluminum alloy, meaning wow. it was made somewhere other than planet Earth. And so to me, what I like about our show is we're not just 
wandering around the Rendlesham Forest or going to Roswell and finding nothing. We're actually, you know, finding solid stuff, and we try to emphasize on our show that, you know, that the actual finding of something mm-hmm. that that you can actually put to the test. Well, that's, that's some pretty that's serious science spectroscopy uh, analysis of metallurgy, uh, and, you know, that's pretty mm-hmm. hard science there, Michael. Yeah, it is. It is. You just it just doesn't. The thing is, it doesn't it matter. <laughs> it doesn't matter how many labs come back with the same result if nobody will, you know, um, if nobody will acknowledge it. And so, hopefully, what we can accomplish on the show is we can just go right around the scientific community that refuses to even consider this stuff and and just kind of shove it down their throats and go mm. straight to the public with it because sure. you know, that's what we're trying to do. And I think it's been. Um, it's been a real, it's been a real fun experience, and I hope it continues. Tell me about ancient aliens, and uh, have you been involved with that in the new episodes, or is that still going? Well, it's still going. There's going to be a season seven. There are other people that have shot some season seven. I have not shot any of mine yet, and honestly, I'm not free to do that until my other show gives a thumbs up or thumbs down on new episodes. If Uncovering mm-hmm. Aliens and Animal Planet say they want me for that show, then I can't do any other shows. So I have to kind of wait and see what they. Uh, what they come up with there, and uh, I, I was able to shoot a TV show for the Sci-Fi Channel about the Moon. It's called, um, I think it's called, uh, you know, uh, Ancient Mysteries of the Moon or something mm-hmm. like that. It's going to be shown here on the Sci-Fi wow, Channel. Wow, that's in interesting. US. I don't know. Do you guys, do you guys have Sci-Fi? Yeah, TV we do. Shows? Yeah, it's do quite have, a lot of. The, it's actually free over here. We get a, a, a lot of free on some of the cable networks. Um, it's quite. Okay. A, yeah, we we get a lot of history sci-fi stuff as well as just sci-fi as well. Like you know. Right, but I mean the actual Sci-Fi Network. Yeah, That's yeah, we I get the Sci-Fi thought. Network here yeah, in okay. UK and Ireland. Okay, we have the so Sci-Fi. You should look for that on on July twentieth. Uh, they're going to be showing that. that wow, show. that's I interesting. Think. I sat for some interviews for that. It should be should be pretty interesting. It's a lot of the stuff is right out of Ancient Aliens on the Moon, out of that book that I wrote. So oh. it, it uh, should cover that. And you know, again, with these things, you sit down and you do them, and you know, it's it's all about how they edit things and how they cut you. And exactly. You never know how it's going to turn out, but. Uh, the producer Bob Kivyat, I thought, did a really good job, uh, at least from my from my experience with him, and and hopefully, it, you know, will uh, it'll be a really interesting show, and it'll again push the discussion forward mm-hmm. and start bringing these kinds of ideas more into the mainstream, so we all don't feel like like we're the black sheep in the family because we're interested in this stuff. Uh-huh. There's a massive interesting in this in the general public now. Everybody from all walks of life, Michael. Um, you know, did you see that coming? Were you a lone ranger for a while, Mike? Uh, pioneer in a way? Yeah, I think so. You know, I got really interested in doing stuff on artifacts and so forth, like in the early 1990s. But what really helped that was was the X Files, to be quite honest with you, because it was a re- you know very popular show, brought a lot of these memes and ideas into the cultural consciousness. And then when that sort of ran its course and faded away, we had a gap there of about 10 years. And and really, then along comes Ancient Aliens. Mm-hmm. And with Ancient Aliens, you have this, this whole new audience of young people. The kids of those folks that watch The X-Files are now grown up, and they're very curious about all this stuff. And they also don't, you know, they don't trust authority quite as much. So when some guy who has the word scientist under his name makes some statement no matter how ridiculous it might be you know there's a a certain percentage of the population that just accepts that because he's an authority figure Mm -hmm. and but these kids the the younger audience they don't necessarily buy into it and they keep asking questions and and you know fortunately we're coming up with a lot of answers for them Mm -hmm. that only of course open up new questions Mm -hmm. so that's the process and you just keep you just keep moving forward by asking the next question mm. of course I, I think in fairness Michael what you do with the moon and the Mars stuff is 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 limited in terms of other researchers I mean there's not many people carry the flag for that one yourself Richard Hogan and in, in fairness as well and I know you've pioneered stuff with Michael uh, with Richard as well and I mean I think a lot of people on ancient aliens they all tap into their own genre and that's fine but I mean not many people want to take this on in, in the manner that you have done Michael and when I first heard you well, talk on I first heard you talk on coast to coast AM about the moon stuff and I was like wow you know it just pays off when you when you dedicate yourself into a research topic you don't know what you're going to find till you're doing it um, and I think you have you know put this genre together because it is a genre of anomalies and mysteries I, I, I sometimes don't know which one's more fascinating Mars or the moon it's like I seem to go between the two yeah yeah um, they're both fascinating and thanks for that you know the thing is the ancient aliens question is 
is fascinating to a lot of people, and it should be because there's all kinds of mysteries about the Earth and and ruins and things that are here on Earth, and and there's some question, you know, did they have the technology to build them? How did they how did they cut and move the 1,400 ton trilithon blocks at Baalbek? How yeah. is that stuff all done? Yeah. And it, you know, you don't you don't know those things. But again, there there could be technologies, there could be techniques, there could be things that we knew back then that we've lost now that we know. And I, I don't mean technologies. I mean, you know, maybe we were able to move our move things with our minds or with other uh, capabilities that mm-hmm. we don't have anymore. Mm-hmm. We don't know. We'll never know. But the thing is, if you can find one artifact, one ruin, one piece of technology on the moon or on Mars, then you've proven the whole ancient alien thesis, at least in the context of somebody was here before that had very advanced knowledge and very advanced technology and probably taught us everything we knew in the ancient, uh, you know, in the ancient world. Do you ever subscribe so, to the idea that... Um, that's why I'm fascinated by it. Michael, do you ever subscribe to the idea that we may have been evolved in the past and it may have been our stuff on the moon or Mars and that we wiped ourselves out? Yeah, that's actually my basic premise. And, you know, in, in my second book, In the Choice, I talk a lot about the the Hopi prophecies and some of the ancient writings of the um, of the, Indo, Indo, um, the uh, Indian cultures, the mm-hmm. ancient cultures of uh, India and Pakistan and that area. And, and basically what the Hopis say, among other things, is that, you know, there have been these three previous worlds of man and that they've been almost as advanced, if not more advanced, than we are today. So it's sort of an, an Atlantis legend or an Atlantis myth that's right there in the Hopi prophecies. And they actually say that we, you know, we visited places like the moon and Mars before. Mm-hmm. And... That's the weird thing about it is because when you look at this technology, when you look at these ruins, these buildings, or this this glass stuff on the moon, I mean, it, to me, it looks like human. It looks like human technology. It yeah. looks like something we would build. It's not. It, it's not alien in the sense that the aesthetic isn't alien. It it looks exactly like what you know you or I as an engineer would design. If we're going to make yeah. a building, we probably make it look like this, and it it, it looks so familiar so close to the kinds of things that we build today only on a much larger scale and of course mm. if you have superior technology and and manufacturing techniques you're you're able to build things on a much larger scale I so think the, uh, that's the, the only difference that we see yeah the glass structures yeah. i think just for the public that, that aren't aware is you know glass is what some 15 20 times stronger on the moon it's it's like another substance it's so rigid and 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 a better yeah it's it's just, it's about as strong as steel in a lunar vacuum if it is made with no moisture in it. It's actually the moisture content of glass which weakens it and mm-hmm. makes it, you know, easily shattered with I guess in the States it would be a baseball. You know, if you throw a throw a baseball at a glass window, you're gonna shatter it. But mm-hmm. that it's because there's water in, in glass. Whereas if you can make uh, some, something on the moon with lunar glass with no moisture in it, yeah. it's about as strong as steel. So it would be the perfect thing to build, let's say, a meteor shield out of. If you were going to sure. build a, a base on the moon where there is essentially a vacuum, I mean, there's always, they always say that the moon tech, the moon has an atmosphere. Well, it really doesn't. I mean, you know, you can you can say that all you want, but it, technically it does, but really it doesn't. It's a, it's a hard vacuum on the lunar surface. And um, the ideal way to build a, a shelter or a meteor shield would be to build it out of glass. Unfortunately, there's there's an abundance of glass on the lunar surface, and mm-hmm. it all doesn't, you know, it's all lunar glass. It doesn't have any moisture in it. And in fact, NASA has um, it, some of their plans for the moon base. When when Bush was talking about going back to the moon, um, all that stuff was again they were going to use lunar glass to protect. The inhabitants of the of the bases. So I mean, it's, what it's what perfect. an awesome building material it is on Earth. The only thing is that it shatters here. But I mean, because it lets in heat, regulates buildings, right. and the lights. Um, you know, it, it's a great mechanism for right. everything. It's just that it fractures here. But if it didn't fracture, it would be our best building material we have on on, on Earth. Like so. Yeah, and it really, it's interesting because it, you know, it really um, would account for a lot of the transient lunar phenomenon Mm -hmm. uh, sightings that have been on, you know, made of the moon over the centuries. I mean, people have been seeing these bright glowing areas on the moon for hundreds of years, even going back a thousand years uh, since we've been making observations. Mm -hmm. And there's really no way to explain that. They've tried theories about, you know, gases escaping and things (laughs) like that. But what it is is simply the light from the sun hitting these glass panes 
at a certain angle, and then that light is reflected back to the observer. And you know, it, it, it also they're described frequently as pink and so forth, or red, or different various different colors. The spectrum which is exactly what you get if you had, you know, sort of multi multiple layers of glass. You yeah. would, you would have a prismatic effect like that. So, yeah, I mean, I think I've I seen Richard Hoagland talk, or he had a photograph where there was a prism effect. You could see the rainbow colours of something. Uh -huh. it, the, the light was being split into its spectrum like the rainbow, and that can only happen with a prism stroke glass object. Yeah, yeah, and there's actually dozens of those pictures that he's found, wow. all taken from the lunar surface, all scanned by NASA, all put on NASA's website. And in a few cases, we've actually been able to go back to the original photographic prints wow. and the original um, photographic negatives, which you used to be able to get from NASA. You can't get them anymore. Wow. Um, as far as I know, you can't get them anymore. And, and compare them, and yeah, they're right there. And again, you can only have these rainbows if you've got a prismatic effect, which is going to be some sort of semi-transparent or transparent material. So, wow. Of course, Michael, know, I just want uh, to mention your website, mikebarra.blogspot.com. You get some of these photos on your website. You've got a Picasso web album there. And, uh, you know, if yeah. anybody wants to listen along and look at your photographs on the site, it's a good thing to do because, like you say, you have high resolution images on the website, mikebarra.blogspot.com, that you can't naturally put into a book because you're limited to uh, Kindle files and stuff like that. But um, just for the yeah. listeners, well, if you, they want you, can't, you can put them in book and you can put them in print, but it just it just loses resolution in mm. print. There's just it, no way around it. Mm. It's something we need the resolution for. When you want to look at fine detail on them and you want high resolution, so... But yeah, yeah so let, let's talk about the moon. I mean, this thing is a very weird object, Michael. The numbers about the moon, the statistics, its location, how it formed. You know, is this man made? Is it a natural thing? I don't even know. I, I'm confused as an engineer. I just know it's not adding up, Michael. It's, it's the, such an odd characteristics about the moon. Well, the thing is, you know, the moon is the the moon and the Earth are the only two objects in the solar system of of such close relative size that actually orbit each other. And you know, there was a a, 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 a physicist named Dr. Tom Van Flander, and actually an astronomer, who had a theory that um, planets actually form by being sort of uh, extruded from the sun. The sun gets spinning really, really fast, and then it begins to it pumps the planets out, and it's called the solar fission theory. These these objects are fissioned away, and then, you know, let's say the Earth would be spinning really intensely fast, and then it would fission off the Moon, and the Moon would orbit around it. And in his model, you know, Venus and Mercury were actually the same sort of relationship as, as the Earth and the Moon. Mm -hmm. The problem was is that there's been some other disasters that have happened in the solar system that have pushed Mercury out of its orbit around Venus, and, you know, anyway, the theory is basically supported by the fact that they've gone really deep in and looked at the um, oxygen isotopic ratios of the lunar surface, the lunar material, mm -hmm. and the Earth, and they found that the Earth and the Moon are made of exactly the same thing. So they have this other theory that, you know, that some Mars-sized object hit the Earth at some point, and, and from that was the moon was created, but logically that couldn't be the case because you would have a mixture of materials from both of these planetary objects, from the Earth and from this Mars-like object, but instead what you find is that the moon is made up of exactly the same stuff as the Earth. So that implies that the Earth, that the moon at least, was once a natural object. The question is, when you start to dig into it and start looking at things, is that it looks like somebody's come along and done a, a lot of upgrades. I mean, they've certainly <laughs> added stuff to the moon. There's areas that look like bases. There's areas that appear to be glass domes that are like a, a watch crystal or something like that. They're, they're really, you know, it's fascinating stuff. And um, there's even areas like around the crater um, Copernicus where you have what are just obviously, you know, massive installations of ruined archaeological architectural buildings and you know generators and these things that look like buried spoke wheels and you can even see places where the lunar surface has been ripped apart or it's been torn and you can see inside and underneath and there's tubular structures and so forth so the moon's a pretty fascinating place and it's got absolutely it's got tons of uh, tons mm -hmm. of mysteries that you can look at and and still see on 
many of the photographs that are out there, although I think it helps to have the early stuff as opposed to what they're putting on the web now. Mm. As a satellite, this thing is very unusual too in that how it forms, Michael. Let me just talk about this because I think this is fascinating. We don't actually know how the moon formed. We, we have hypotheses and theories of how the moon is there at its distance and it's it just so also happens to be a certain ratio to the earth that it, uh, an eclipse happens and it's this 2160 miles in diameter or 1080 as a radius and all these mm -hmm. st other strange things too my god yeah the thing for it you know it's some people the, the fact is the moon is almost exactly to right down to the to the very inch 2160 miles around now, 2160 is an important number if you listen to, for instance, astrologers and so forth, because that's the exact number of years in an age of the houses of the Zodiac, is 2160. So you've got these weird numerological connections, and there's several more um, uh, you know, uh, around the moon that are, that are connected to the same uh, kind of weird little numerology. Mm. But the fact that it's exactly that diameter, and that it is exactly the distance that it is from the earth enables it to actually create a perfect total solar or sorry lunar you know solar eclipse where it abs absolutely blots out this disk of the sun exactly perfectly now for the the fact is that that is beyond any kind of coincidence you could possibly have i mean the idea that this thing is exactly the right size and exactly the right distance to create a perfect solar eclipse is just, it, you know, it, it, to me it's beyond coincidence. Now, mm. I, I don't know who, whose idea it was. <laughs> I don't know, you know, who came up with this idea of a designer solar system, but there's no question in my mind that that is an indication that somebody planned this out very, very carefully. Mm. And oh, of course. you go beyond that and you start looking at, at the origins of it. Well, again, I think the origin of the moon is that it was sort of fissioned off the Earth and it's um you know it's now part of it, it's actually part of the earth it came from the earth and i think that that's a mystery that they really don't want to deal with mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. they didn't really don't want to deal with in, in the astronomical community because i think it's it's kind of it blows their whole current theory which is the accretion model yeah. and they'd have to rethink everything that they think about how planets and solar systems form because mm. all the I, I know this from megaliths and henges and stuff and ancient cultures British Isles Europe and the, in America the the mounds of Ohio they all incorporate 1080 and 2160 into it as well um, mm -hmm. and uh, mm -hmm. you know and these are where lunar worshiping cultures like um, you know this 2160 is all over the place like you know it's an incredibly interesting angle on it in terms of numbers too um, I just find everything about the moon fascinating in, in its location its size is it true that this thing rang like a bell, Michael? I, I've heard this. I don't know if it's true or not. I don't know. I just think they dropped a, a satellite and I think they were looking for a puff of dust to come up out of it to analyze it. And they said it rang like a bell. Is this true? Yeah, it is true. Actually, back in the Apollo days, um, I want to say it's Apollo 16. They had placed seismometers on the lunar surface at each one of the Apollo landing sites. And on Apollo 16, they deliberately crashed the Apollo 16 uh, ascent module to um, into the it, it, which was named Orion mm. into the lunar surface. And when they did that, they were very specifically listening to see what kind of seismic activity they would have. Sure. What they ended up having was the the moon itself kind of rang with that resonance of that that seismic frequency for I think it was over. 14 hours. Wow. It should not have done that. And, and that hours. implies that there are vast caverns inside the moon, that it is essentially hollow. mostly hollow. And those are things that they simply did not expect. And then, interestingly, on Apollo 17, um, there was a, a, a very secret uh, experiment that nobody still to this day knows what it was or will reveal what it was about. And they, they called it Chapel Bell. It was, it was Project or Operation Chapel Bell that the astronauts performed. And, and again, it was a Defense Department project, and nobody knows what it, it, it uh, involved, but I would suspect it involved something to do with confirming those previous results.
So, um, wow, that's you know, fascinating. I, it, it did. It is true that it rang like a bell for about about fourteen hours. I believe that it, it had to me, Mike. And when you just talk about what we just talked about, that it implies it's an artificial artificial object. Maybe it's got a skin around it. Maybe it was put in stationary orbit to regulate our tides, because that's what it does. Also, I mean, without the moon yeah. being exactly there at that weight at that distance. Um, maybe it's smaller and heavier, but then it's further away. Regardless, the, the ratio of the weight to its location and its gravitational pull at exactly where it's at, you know, regulates your tides. We would be covered with storms and all sorts of weird and wonderful stuff, you know, and we wouldn't be able to have the civilization we have on Earth. Well, it regulates the tides and it also kind of controls the angular momentum, the spin energy of the planet to make mm. it a tolerable 24-hour period. And, you know, there's even... There's even a, a, another branch of physics, hyperdimensional physics, that mm -hmm. talks about how that relationship actually is what helps generate the magnetic field of the planet Earth, which, of course, allows everything to survive and be alive on the planet because it protects us from a lot of very harmful radiation. So, um, yeah, all that stuff is true. All that stuff is, um, yeah. is uh, it's all you know, data. Re it's, relevant, it's... and we couldn't live without it. Yeah. Sure, we really couldn't. I mean, we're, we're talking actual measurable data here, Michael. This isn't like uh, pulling out of the, you know, thin air. I mean, this is all measurable, quantifiable data. And when mm -hmm. you look at it all for the moon, um, you know, it, it just adds up to the most amazing coincidence that was ever discovered of all time. Like, or, you know, it's an intentional design behind it. I, I favor it not being, I, I think of something like the Death Star in Star Wars or something sitting there orbiting and looking at us like. Um, yeah, you know, perhaps you know. Do we know anything about the back of the moon and why? Uh, can you maybe explain first of all why we don't we have see the other side of the moon and then maybe the hypothesize? Do you think there's something on the other side of the moon? Well, we've got pictures of the dark of the dark side or the back side of the moon. It's it's called the dark side. In reality, it's not dark. Every side of the the moon is illuminated at one point or another. Mm -hmm. um, but but yeah, it what's happening is that the Earth is in what's what's called a, essentially a tidal lock relationship with the Moon. The Earth is more massive; it generates a stronger gravitational field, and the Moon rotates in a synchronized fashion with the Earth, so that it always shows the same face to the Earth. Now there is some wobble in that, so you do get little parts of the lunar limb that show up and then don't show up as it wobbles back and forth in its twenty-seven day cycle. But, you know, this is something we see all over the solar system. We see um, other moons around Jupiter and, and Saturn, for instance, mm -hmm. are all in tidal lock conditions where they always show the same face to their parent planet. And it also creates tidal bulges on both worlds. You have these bulges of the, the sphere of the moon and the sphere of the Earth. In the Earth's case, it's mostly water, you know, pointed towards the object that's orbiting around. So you have this uh, condition that, it, basically because it has lost enough of its spin energy, it's been stolen by the Earth, so to speak, mm -hmm. that it now just shows the same face to the Earth at all times as it rotates around the, the sun. Now, on the backside, there's a lot of fascinating stuff. We found, um, you know, th there's some images that, that came out that I put out in, um, in Ancient Aliens on the Moon mm -hmm. of what I call the, the Daedalus Ziggurat, which is this pyramid-type mm. object that was found... Um, on the on the backside near the crater Daedalus, and wow. you know the backside's a fascinating place. It's different than the front. In the front, you've got these very dark areas, the maria, which are you know called seas because they look like dark seas from the planet Earth that uh, they originally thought were probably caused by um, by what they felt were, were dark basaltic lavas. But when they went there and actually picked up some rocks from those areas and tested them, they, they found that they weren't basalt. So they really don't have a good explanation for why they're dark. And there's, there's some different theories about that, but there's none of this dark stuff on the backside. It's pretty much, um, pretty much just a bunch of, of craters. So, you know, could it be that the gravitational force of the earth pulled stuff up from deep inside the moon when it was forming Nobody really knows. There's uh, there's areas where there are heavy gravity wells, very very powerful gravity um, wells wow. that that you know are considered called mass cons on the lunar surface or underneath the lunar surface. That you know they had to adjust their orbits because the the spacecraft would get pulled up or down depending on the intensity of the gravity. And there's about half a dozen of those on the front face of the moon, and really none on the back. So you've got all these di dichotomous sort of differences. Nobody really knows exactly why they they happen that way but certainly it's a you know it's something to to think about and reasons to continue to explore 
You know, I'm sh we're chatting here, Michael. This sounds like one of the biggest mysteries mankind's ever come across, and it seems to be ignored. You know, it's like we're talking major anomalies here, Michael. That's yet to be answered. Yeah, and they and they just kind of act like you know, there's nothing to see here. Just move on. I mean, recently, I guess Buzz Aldrin did a <clears throat> conversation on Reddit, and um, mm -hmm. he said that you know that we shouldn't really bother with the moon anymore. We should just go on to Mars. And I'm like, dude, there's so many there's so many uh, mysteries that we should be investigating on the lunar surface right next door. Mm -hmm. That you know, it just it's that to me, that's kind of crazy talk. There's uh, sure. it's a lot easier to get to the moon and back well, it, than it is to get to Mars and back right now. Precisely, and I mean, we we know we can well we've proven we can get to the moon. I'm actually going to talk about that in a minute. I mean, we 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 can get to the moon. We can get home relatively easy you know to make the trip to mars if they ever do get there with our present technology of rocket fuel it's going to be extremely difficult extremely dangerous the mission success rate you know getting home safely is going to be you know i i think low i mean you'd be confident that the people and the skill set that we have as a as a technology we, we can pull it off but you know it's still a lot can go wrong at that distance you know um, yeah, you know, and, and the big question is for a lot of people and a lot of conspiracies out there is that did we go to the moon, Michael? Now, personally, I, I kind of like what you talk about is that, yeah, we did, but there's a cover story making out that we didn't and they've let this conspiracy thing run because when we did get there, we found some stuff. Maybe we went to go and get the stuff that's on the moon. Maybe we wanted mm -hmm. some of the technology there, you know, so maybe let's talk about that and maybe give us a reason why we definitely went to the moon. Well, first of all, they they started this theory. NASA was the one who started mm. the conspiracy theory that we never went to the moon. When when Richard Hoagland was covering the Apollo Eleven mission for an, uh, an American magazine back in uh, back in 1969, while while Buzz and Michael Collins and Neil Armstrong were still mm -hmm. on the return trip coming back from the moon, he was at JPL in the press office office there in uh, in one of the the um, buildings, press building there. Mm -hmm. And a NASA public relations officer was escorting some guy around the press office as he was handing out these pamphlets to wow. every news organization in the world that claimed that the whole thing had been faked in a movie studio in Nevada. They didn't say Area 51 because nobody knew about Area 51 at that point. But this guy was actually passing these pamphlets out to members of the American media on, you know, uh, July 22nd, 1969, while the astronauts were still on their way back. And so NASA are the ones who started that rumor. And so you then begin to think, knowing as I know that NASA is a bunch of duplicitous a-holes, yeah. why would they do that? And, and to me, the reason that they would do that is to create a fake conspiracy theory, a fake conspiracy meme that was easily discredited, easily disproven, and... That way, nobody would ever believe any other conspiracy theories about mm. why we went to the moon and what we found there. The conspiracy theory has so, already you know, been done. Yeah, the conspiracy theory has already yeah, happened. I, I mean, in, in terms of what's the proof that we went there? Well, you know, we've got pictures of the landing sites. We can see the astronauts' footprints. We can see where they drove the lunar rover. We've got all the photographs that are all coordinated with the right times they were there. Um, you know, none of the arguments that we couldn't have made it actually add up. We had plenty of technology. There's been some excellent videos about film, the film technology of the time, basically mm -hmm. showing that we nobody really possessed sufficient technology to have uh, to have created the videos that we've seen. So, you know, it's one of those kinds of things where it just it, it, it's not so much that you can prove that they went, but the idea that we didn't go just doesn't pan out. Mm -hmm. So I actually you know, kind none of, none of it, I kind of favor, Michael, that maybe they did have a studio and they put up some dummy stuff to make it, you know, maybe for the conspiracy scenario that they were creating, but they still have all this real stuff there that they went by. Well, there's a guy named Jay, Jay Widener who oh, Jay Widener, yeah. wants, to, Jay wants to believe that Stanley Kubrick faked the whole thing in a in a studio in Area 51 or something. And, and he's come up with, uh, you know, yeah. his theory on that. Uh, Again, I don't find any evidence for that. I think I can I can blow most of Jay's arguments out of the water pretty mm -hmm. quickly. Mm -hmm. And his theory is that yeah, they actually did go, but they had Kubrick film fake stuff, yeah, so they could cover up what the astronauts were really doing when they were there. And that's, you know, that's an idea. Yeah, I don't see a whole lot of evidence to support it at this point. Yeah, but it's just you know, it's like okay, that's one idea. It's not necessarily one I concur with, and I don't. I I think again, I can shoot down most of his evidence and. Jay and I have talked briefly about you know doing a um, doing a debate maybe back at his uh, in Colorado at some point 
where we argue uh, about the photography. Wow, the photography that'd be interesting. Itself. But, you know, I mean, there's other situations. You know, Apollo, uh, Apollo 17, they, they went to an area called Nansen, which was near a mountain called the South Massif. The South Massif is essentially a hexagonal looking mountain with one side blown out looks wow. like for some kind of internal explosion and nansen is this v-shaped depression that goes underneath the mountain and what they did is they drove the rover up to the very top of that so you couldn't look directly into it with the camera they dismounted the rover they turned the camera on and then they start to explore the area and for the next 20 25 minutes the camera is controlled by nasa and it pans everywhere except where the astronauts are working. You don't see <laughs> wow. anything that they're doing. Wow. And when they get done with it, they come back and CERN and says, we weren't, just, just so you guys back there know, we weren't really able to look around any more than you've seen. And of course, How we me. hadn't seen anything How because they weren't showing us what they were doing. And they certainly had time to walk down in there, take a look and see if that was a doorway into this thing, which it, it kind of looks to me like it was. So, you know, again, it's a situation where I don't think they had to fake anything because because of the way things were set up. They they had very bad cameras. Mm -hmm. When they got better cameras, they controlled how they were, you know, where they were pointed, what they were pointed at on Apollo 12, where I think they landed right smack in the middle of a bunch of these ruins. The first thing that, um, that uh, <clears throat> Al Bean or uh, Pete Conrad did was, Mm -hmm. was take the camera and point it directly at the sun, which is the one thing you're not supposed to do, and burn the camera out. So we have we have no video footage of Apollo 12 to speak of. We have about five or ten minutes. You know, We wow. have none of, of the area where they were. So you, you just got a bunch of things like that where I think there were lots of ways where they could have um, – they, they, you know, they they could have hidden things or done things kind of in plain sight or just out of sight. Why would they keep without, faking it? Why would they keep going back to fake it? That's what I don't get. So I mean, that's why I don't get that. I mean, you wouldn't keep going back faking the same thing. You wouldn't. You don't need to fake it two, three times. Whatever. Yeah, yeah. One of the pilots. Uh, one of the pilots. I want to say it's Al Warden, but I'm not positive. Said in in this uh, really great documentary called In the Shadow of the Moon, he says. Come on, he goes, if we were going to fake it, why would we fake it nine times? You know, yeah. we went to the moon nine times. Why would we fake it nine times if we were going to fake it? Yeah. And again, I think that's a really strong argument for saying that the whole thing is just a little bit silly. Yeah, you know, and, and, and like I say, I mean, I, I have to hand it to NASA if they did set up a studio and, and or give out a fake uh, conspiracy theory. I mean, it was successful, Michael. It was successful in terms of... You know, it fueled the conspiracy theorists and it covered up what really went on. And then there's also the people that think they really went to the moon. So it's it's done its three things there, Mike. Right. And that's the thing. If And, and whenever you say to somebody, you know, they ask you, are you, are you a conspiracy theorist? And you say, yeah, the first thing they say is, oh, so you think we didn't go to the moon? huh? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm like, no, I don't. I don't think that at all. That's not what I think at all. So why not? Um, why not go to the moon? You kind of have to defending yourself. Why not go back to the moon anymore? Why stop at the eleven missions? Did they guys get what they wanted? Could they? Did they get warned off, Michael? Because a lot of people throw that one about as well. Well, there's the rumors that they got warned off, but again, there's no there's no proof that they got warned off, and it is kind of odd that we haven't gone back. But it's not so odd when you think about it in terms of the political context of the day if you had a situation where you had to do this with public money and you had to do it with public technology and so forth we've had you know we've gone through a period of 25 or 30 or 40 years now where um where there have been other political priorities and people have wanted to spend money on other things mm. and you know they unfortunately have had a kind of a sway over the news media there's a definite bent to the news media here in the united states i think it's it's pretty much worldwide. It bends to the left, and everybody's always saying, well, why don't we spend the money at home on poor people, you know, so we can get the poor people to vote for us, rather than spend it on going exploring some dead rock. And as long as NASA's position on the moon is that it's a dead rock and there's nothing really worth learning about it, um, it's kind of hard to justify spending billions and billions to go back. And I think that's as big a reason why we've never gone back as any. I think it's just, you know, overt, mm -hmm. the overt politics of it. Mm -hmm. So that does not mean we haven't secretly gone back. And it does not mean that other countries are not interested in going back, which I suspect they are. Mm -hmm. And they're all building, a lot of them are building programs to go to the moon. The question is, if it's really just a dead rock, what's the advantage of going there? And um, you kind of got to wonder, why are the Chinese going to spend all this money to try to go to the moon? Why are the Indians trying to go to the moon? Why, why are all these different spacefaring countries now looking at going back to the moon? And I 
don't know. My guess is that they think that we didn't share everything that we found <laughs> when we went there, and they want to go get some of it for themselves. But I, that's pure speculation, and it's just my that's just my thought. I I don't. There was a lot of fact. Uh, well, the thing that gets me as well is like you know I, I accept that they went to the moon. Um, I also accept there was a fake conspiracy theory, and I, you know, but I mean, even if you didn't, even why have all these secret conversations, Michael? Why have all these private conversations on air, off air? You know, it, yeah, it's yeah. extra icing on the cake for me, Mike. Yeah, and there's really weird stuff. I mean, there's stuff that I went over in, in Ancient Aliens on the Moon, and we also went over in Dark Mission, where on Apollo 10, you know, Apollo 10 had the full capability of landing on the lunar surface. They were just prevented from doing so. They, they didn't give them enough fuel to actually land. They crippled the spacecraft, so they couldn't possibly land. And I, you think about it, if the real purpose of, of going to the moon was to beat the Russians politically... Um, why wouldn't you land the first opportunity you have? Why would you do a test run and yet not give them enough fuel to go to land there? And, and you know, again, it's because, in my opinion, it's because there w wasn't time yet. There wasn't sufficient time to actually, uh, mm -hmm. they had to do things when the stars were right and all these other weird things that NASA does. But, you know, Gene Cernan is, is there um, on Apollo 10. He also was on the you know, Apollo 17 commander. And, you know, he quote, he's quoted as saying things like, wow, we're really down among them now. And they're at 50,000 feet. Okay, so they're 10 miles above the lunar. There's no mountains on the moon wow. <laughs> that are 50,000 feet high. So mm. what's he talking about? And the mm. only thing I can think of that he's talking about is, is the, these giant glass towers that, that we've seen in so many different photographs of the moon that mm -hmm. we've talked about earlier. And that's, yeah. that's all I can think of that he's referring to when he says we're really down among them now. So there's all this sort of secret, coded, interesting conversations that take place, and you gotta kind of you gotta kind of put them together in your head and say, does this make sense, and how does it fit, and and you know what are they really talking about here? I'm looking on your website, Mike, at the glass towers above the moon. There, it's awesome. They're just like like glass city tower blocks. Yeah, and the thing is, you know, it's interesting because I've gotten into some rather heated debates on my Picasso web album with people who say, oh, there's scratches on the print or scratches on the negative and and you know originally what was done with these is that the, the negatives were ordered from the national space science data center and other archives and they were taken to a photographic lab and they were enhanced at the lab and the people at the lab were you know they they, they examined the emulsion they examined right down to the they got into the grain of the film and they, excuse me, they verified that there were no scratches on the film. There was no, never any scratches on any of the film. So none of that stuff is scratches on the film. Wow. None of that stuff is um, artifacts of the enhancement process because the enhancement process at that time was extremely primitive. Somebody tried to tell me it was because it was a JPEG, and I'm like, no, they were all, they were all full resolution TIFF scans at the time, which have no compression, so they're not compression artifacts. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, too, is that all of these glass structures that you see, they, they follow the lighting geometry of the local vertical. In other words, they, they, you should see kind of a bell curve where the brightest stuff is in the middle of the picture, and then, and then the glass True. sort of fades as exactly. the light fades. You don't have an exact, you know, the light's not coming in, and it follows the geometry of light scattering. Wow. They all do. So, you know, again, that's how you know you're actually looking at something where light passed through it on the surface of the moon. That's what you're actually looking at. And, um, you know, and again, all this stuff was confirmed. It was all confirmed in the 1990s by a team called, the, they call itself the Lunar Anomaly Research Group out of um, McDonnell Douglas in St. Louis, led by a gentleman named Marvin Zarnick, the late Marv Zarnick, who's not with us anymore. He was one of the people who helped Buzz Aldrin come up with the rendezvous and docking procedures for spacecraft. They're the ones that figured out the math to actually rendezvous two spacecraft in orbit. And, um, you know, these were not stupid people. And they went, yep, you know, it's all there. It's really there. So gone through all that stuff. But, again, every time a new generation comes along, they think they're smarter than everybody else. And, sure. Sure. And they they hit you with the same arguments you've dealt with for twenty some years, you know. I remember my history in school, Mike, and I remember doing the Cuban Missile Crisis and Khrushchev, and then all that time frame we were doing up just up to barely modern history, and, and then we had the space race kick off, um, and and the initial go to the moon, and and it was always you know the Russians against the Americans, who's going to get there first, and I somehow kind of believed that certain amount that there was a natural space race. 
uh, due to political struggles between Russia and America. However, I do somehow also think that the Americans had prior knowledge that they were going to discover something, that there was something there. Do you feel that, Mike? Do you think they knew what they were going to find? Or do you think perhaps, uh, you know, they discovered it when they got there and they went, oh, my God. No, they they definitely knew that there was something there before they ever went. I think that's definitely the, the, the case. There's no there's really no way you can argue that. Mm-hmm. But what I don't know, what I can't tell you is what that document is. I don't I've never been able to obtain that particular document. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, at, at, at this point, um, uh, I, I can't I can't say mm-hmm. where that information came from. But what I will say is that um <clears throat> I think they had prior knowledge for sure. sure. And that's actually, I'm, I'm going to be looking at doing another book next year, wow. which is going to be called ancient aliens and secret societies. And, um, you know, in that one, I think we're going to deal with that, with well, that a little bit more. You, um, you just in led depth. into my next question. And it was, I, again, I, I, I hear these rumors and you, you, you're a guy, you're a researcher, Mike, that's going to know the answers to this stuff, which is why I'm throwing it. Was there a Masonic ceremony on the moon? We know that uh, a lot of the astronauts are, uh, linked uh, through Masonic orders, I think the same order. Um, but was there a Masonic ceremony in the room uh, on, on the moon? There had there had to be. I mean, the thing is, Aldrin brought. Um, we know this for a fact. He brought a Scottish Rite thirty third degree apron with him um, wow. to the moon, and and it's a it's a ceremonial apron that would be used in a Masonic ceremony. You don't do that unless you're going to use it in a ceremony. You know, that's why you bring the ceremonial apron is to use it in a Masonic ceremony. He admits that he did what he called a communion ceremony where he read from the book of John uh, at one point. And the question is, you know, there's a couple different possibilities for when that took place. He, there's a time when he says it happened. It could have taken, at, taken place at 33 minutes after landing. But the bottom line is that if you trace the origins of that ceremony back, that is also a Masonic ceremony. So when mm-hmm. you look back at um, at that, what you can what you can say absolutely is that everything was there for them to have done it or for him to have done it. And the communion ceremony he talks about is actually, like I said, a, it's a it's a Masonic ceremony. So oh. um, I would have to say the answer to that is absolutely yes. Wow. You know, we have we have talk of, uh, and this is going to go down the conspiratorial route, but we have talk of uh, NASA being formed out of the Nazis that were absorbed to America, the, the Nazi, Nazi scientist Von Braun, and when they were absorbed into America because of they had all the knowledge and the skill, and, and the Germans were advancing in rocket technology, they absorbed them into America, and that's where NASA kind of got its thing. And then we also have the uh, Freemason route of, uh, you know, uh, you know, control through the astronauts and, and and the knowledge of what's going on. I mean, where does the conspiracy end, Michael? I mean, is it is it both? Is it Nazis and Masonic, or you know, is it is it, it's a weird melting pot of conspiracies, Michael? Yeah, it is. But you know what what uh, Hoagie and I talked about in Dark Mission mm. was that um, the fact that in reality it was you had three different groups. At NASA, operating at NASA, you had the Nazis, mm-hmm. which were all the German rocket scientists, many of whom were were high ranking Nazis. Yeah. You had what we called, you know, the Freemasons, which were a, a group where you can easily show who was associated with whom. Ken, Kenny S. Kenny Kleinkinect was the brother of C. Fred Kleinkinect, who was the head of the thirty third degree Scottish Rite mm-hmm. of the Temple in Washington mm-hmm. D.C., which is the group from which Buzz Aldrin took. The Masonic apron to the moon and performed his ceremony. That was the that was a specific, um, you know, temple from which he took that flag and brought it back. And then you have what we call the the magicians, who were out basically running things at JPL, and, and they were many of them followers were of Aleister Crowley and a lot of the things that he was teaching. And all of them at their root core belief system, every single one of those three groups, basically believe that they, that we, the human race, were directly descended from extraterrestrial gods who had previously inhabited the moon mm-hmm. and Mars and had come to the Earth and taught us everything we know about science and agriculture and astronomy. So all that stuff um, all fits together. And then you look at the different ceremonial things they did. You know, for instance... The, pro- the original Apollo project had Orion 
on the Apollo mission patch, and that particular you know that particular constellation is crucially important to the ancient egyptians belief systems and it, it comes back to the worship of osiris and the offering that aldrin did was basically a ceremony that that was designed to be an offering to osiris and the freemasons origins have been traced back to the worship of isis and osiris and horus these very specific egyptian gods and the nazis had all their roots basically thinking that they were descended from isis osiris and horus you know mm -hmm. and you've got these groups that all believe the same thing and all think they're descended from these ancient egyptian gods who were in fact extraterrestrials so it all goes back to the ancient aliens thing. So I think, you know, that's the, th the reason why I've got to write the, the book next year, because I don't think I could do the whole ancient aliens on Mars and ancient aliens on the moon thing without talking about ancient aliens and secret societies and, mm -hmm. and their influence on NASA and our space exploration. It's like a side research project. It's like a it's, it's like research behind the research in a way, Michael. Yeah, and, and in fact, it is. There's, yeah. Uh, yeah. That's the reality of it, yes. Michael, of course, I, I'm going on about the moon here. We're here to talk about your latest book. Um, I, I think it's pertinent because I can see where your research is. I wanted to do some justice on the moon, and I think it's equally fascinating, uh, our nearest neighbor as well. But we are here to talk about Mars uh, and the, the strange stuff on Mars as well. I, I think in terms of geometry structures i think we got more tangible stuff there in terms of photographs uh, um but yeah i mean why the why the second book on ancient aliens on mars well um the truth is that you know with the first book uh i i really couldn't um i i, I just couldn't finish i couldn't put everything in it mm. and get it done on time and there was a lot of stuff that was left over and i begin to think about it and say to myself well you know there's a lot of things that i didn't really cover and some things I'd like to go more more in depth on mm -hmm. and where I started was is there was some leftover stuff about the face on Mars what, what happened with ancient aliens on Mars is that there was so much about Sidonia and the face in there that I ran out of space to talk about other things I wanted yeah. to talk about like the, the monolith on Phobos and oh, yeah, um, yeah. the the infrared stuff from from Sidonia which is which is a really interesting cloak and daggerish kind of back and forth with NASA where they tried to trip Hoagie and, and me and the other researchers up with some infrared data, which actually showed that there is a, a, a massive city beneath the surface at Sidonia. So there was, there was that that we had to clear up. And then there was other stuff about the rovers. There's so many mm -hmm. things, like you said, the rovers. I mean, every day people are finding pictures of stuff that are obviously tools and instruments and mechanisms and even what look like fossils on mm -hmm. the surface of Mars. So I just didn't have time to go over everything. Um, and I wanted, so I ended up writing the second book. And I, you know, it, it ended up blowing me away because I discovered, as you dig, you just discover yeah. so many more things that you can talk about. So mm -hmm. many more things that are, that are extraordinary on the images. And mm -hmm. that's what I like about you, Michael. The, 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 sorry, sorry. But, no, there's one that I, I really, I really wanted to go after. I've been wanting to go after in the first book, and it's called, the area is called Parrot City, is what they call it, because some people thought that they saw, you know, the the image of a parrot uh, in the ground, and right next to this, what people think is a parrot, is this incredible, extraordinary city. There's an absolute cityscape there. Wow. And as I started to dig into this city structure, I just found some of the most amazing, fascinating buildings and things that that I've ever seen, and they're they're so powerful and so obvious. Um, and when you see them online, see the pictures online. You know, you can look at them in the book to read up on them for reference. But when you see them online, there's just there's no question you're looking at artificial structures. And I also again caught NASA trying to sort of cover this up and um, hide it. And and again, it's just amazing stuff and and there's signs of life on all over mars that they appear to have been trying to cover up so you know uh that's the i just key had to do more and and that's what that's what drove me to write the second book sorry mike that's the key thing i, I think the dimension here is that if, if if nasa turned around and went to accepted public awareness and went hey look guys this is interesting yes it does look this way but you know we'll look into it and then turned around and said no it's not it's just an anomaly and yeah, it's a light mm -hmm. shot. If they did that approach, that would maybe be more believable. But just turning around and trying to tell people there's nothing to see here, go home. It's like an admonition of guilt in a way, Mike. You know, it's, it's, it's it is. It's, it, it is. Yeah, the constant there, there, nothing to see here. Move along. You know. Uh, I mean, well, remember that thing? There was a little um, figurine 
that that they found. It looked like a little mermaid figure or something uh, off in the corner of one picture on the surface of Mars. And NASA types attacked anybody who thought it might be anything interesting. And, and their basic argument was that, well, that's ridiculous. It couldn't possibly be a statue. It's only about two inches tall. Well, you know, again, in the book, I point to a number of statues of the pharaohs that were created by the Egyptians that are about two inches tall. So that's, you know, again, that's just a ridiculous argument. It's mm. not even logical. Yeah. And, and there's other stuff that you see it and you just, you know, there's no question that they're, they're metal cased, they're sheet metal cased objects. I mean, if you've done engineering, you've done any kind of work on engineering, you, mm. you know what things look like. They, yeah. sheet metal, you know, electrical boxes, boxes with electronics and computers mm -hmm. have a sheet, typically have a sheet metal case. And that's going to be thin and, you know, it, it has a certain look to it. And there's stuff all over the surface of Mars that glows like metal. It reflects, you know, light like metal, and they, they're partially buried and eroded, but you can see, you know, you can see pins and clevises and connector spots, and you can see the the area where there, there used to be a, a box-like shape around it. That's hmm. in addition to the pyramids and wow. and the, um, the, the mechanical stuff. There's, there's stuff that looks exactly like turbochargers and flywheels and jet engine casings, you know, the central part of a jet engine, all mm. over the place. And wow. anybody who's done engineering can look at that stuff and say, that's that's a mechanism. Mm. And there's stuff that looks exactly like bones. They look exactly like spines of dinosaurs or snakes or something. And, mm -hmm. and you know, you do a visual comparison of one on Earth and one on Mars, and, mm -hmm. you know, I, I'm open, man. Please tell me what the difference is uh, between what I'm looking at on sure. Mars and no, what I'm looking you're at totally on Earth. You're totally right. You know, Michael, it's having a skill set like yourself from your your career and then also being in the driving seat. It's not enough to have your skill set and look at a couple of random photographs. I mean, you dedicated yourself to this research, and I, and I appreciate that because it's sometimes you just need to be in the driving seat. And if you're not in the driving seat and continuing to be in the driving seat, you're not going to discover stuff, you know. And unfortunately, some people, you know, they, they'll, they, they won't get into the driving seat. They don't want to look at it, you know. And you've created this genre of research that's, like, dedicated and it's turning up stuff time and time again, and I commend you on it. I will say, I watched the uh, conference or documentary of yourself and Jason Martell and a couple of others, and uh, I remember you were you made a very key point there, and it was like, you know, some people are maybe looking to find something, and it's and it's it's not beside anything else. And and I think a lot of what you're talking about here, uh, Mike, is that all these objects are found beside other things, like you know, Cydonia is beside the face, right. the, the the pyramid complex. These things are not just random objects appearing, you know, in the middle of a desert landscape on Mars. You point this out. This is how you know the authenticity of this stuff is that it's beside another thing. It, these right. things are all beside each other, Michael. Right. Well, that's that's true, and it's not always the case. Sometimes there are things that are more in isolation, but mm. they are still blatantly artificial. It's really it's a case of you know the case could be really good, but if, for instance, the face on Mars was all by itself and there was nothing else around it that was at all unusual, that would be a harder case to make. But the fact that it is surrounded by all this other stuff that's you know there's a five sided pentagonal pyramid a few miles away that's symmetric that, you know symmetrical bilaterally symmetrical about two different axes. And, you know, that's impossible. There's, the thing is, like, you look at, there's a pyramid in, um, in Ancient Aliens on Mars 1 in the first book that's found in Elysium that is an exact match. It's an exact match for a collapsing, eroded period in China. The only difference is the scale, but when you overlay them on each other, they match up exactly. Now, wow. if you were to find that in the middle of nowhere on Earth, your immediate assumption would be that it's a pyramid and you would start to excavate. But you find it on Mars, and it's like, oh, no, it, it can't possibly be a pyramid. And, and the fact that it's isolated um, would tend to, like, undermine it, it, it as artificial, except that when you think about it, Elysium is an area where there have been all kinds of pyramids spotted. Carl Sagan made a big deal out of the pyramids of Elysium. They were tetrahedral pyramids. This is another four-sided pyramid, you know, some distance away from that. But the area around Elysium seems to be full of pyramidal structures. So... Um, that is a good point, but it's also true that you can occasionally find something in isolation. And what you've got to do then is you've really got to dig in and say, just what is the likelihood that this is some sort of geologic formation versus um, versus something you know artificial? And I guess to me, the big difference between the two of them, what makes it the most obvious, is that that artificial stuff tends to be a lot more complex than natural geology. Sure. And I think I think the parrot 
is a good example of that. If you look at what people think is the parrot, it looks like a water eroded or wind eroded bump. But when you look at the city right next to it, there is infinite complexity. Mm -hmm. And you can see things that are quite obviously vents and bunkers and buildings and cooling tubes or something and you know i mean there's buildings there's buildings where the workers lived and then there you see the road that leads right up to it oh they must have taken this road to walk up and go to work you know so it's um it's incredible stuff but it has an it, it has a consistency mm. that's what really separates it again me. i'm looking at your photos here some of these photos are absolutely awesome of mars i mean um it's clear well, to I me. Just posted, I just posted the new stuff from Ancient Aliens on Mars too. That should just be up in the photo album now, wow. and um, and I really encourage everybody to go take a look at some of that yeah, stuff. That's, again, that's mikebarra.blogspot.com. You'll find the link there in the photo section for the Picasso yeah. web album. You, you know, the, the photo evidence is is damning against NASA and, and I cover up. Okay, so f let's leave NASA out of the equation. Let's get into the analysis. I mean, look, I think Jason told me quite recently as well, uh, Jason Martell, about the Cydonia beachfront property uh, idea that, you know, there seems to be evidence of a, a waterfront being near the Cydonia complex, as we call it. Mm -hmm. um, well, there was a, there was at one time they, they thought Cydonia might be part of an ancient shoreline. I think they kind of recently backed away from that. Mm -hmm. um, but, it you know, it doesn't need necessarily to be part of a shoreline mm -hmm. for it to be something significant or even artificial because we really don't know what Mars was like before the catastrophe mm -hmm. that destroyed it. Sure. And, um, you know, there could have been life in many, many different places. And, and actually the best way to really look at that is if you go back to Ancient Aliens on Mars, one, the first mm -hmm. book. Sure. Um, what we've got, what I've got there is, uh, is you know, basically discussing the Mars tidal model, which is the idea that Mars was a tidal locked moon of another planet, the super Earth, which has exploded and mm. devastated the planet, and that that messed everything up. I mean, I think it's unlikely we're going to find much evidence of habitation in the southern hemisphere of Mars. I think most of it's going to be in the northern hemisphere. Mm. I'm looking at an overlaid map here, Michael, of the Sidonia complex with the geometry and relationship model. Uh, it's in your folder. This is incredible. This is screaming. This is like a, this is like a Giza complex, like all the pyramids. Like you know, we got mm -hmm. pyramids aligning to the face on Mars, aligning to the, another structure to the right, another structure to the left. You know, it all matches up. I mean, this is this is not random. This is not nature. Um, no, it doesn't appear to be random to me either. And the thing is that um, the thing is that you know you you look at those kinds. There's all kinds of stuff that's been lost over the years in studying this. I mean, if you look at the Sidonia complex, one of the things I don't know if I put the graphic in in there or not, but one of the things that's generally uh, overlooked, for instance, is that when you look at the um, the city complex, you see these objects, the the city. The so-called city square, the mm -hmm. the edge of the fort, um, the face itself, and then what the, what's called the cliff, and what you find is that is that they have a ratio of one to two to four to eight as you go left to right. Yeah. And I mean, okay, really, these are geologic formations that are completely anomalous that don't actually have any relationship to each other. In other words, whatever they are, they would have all had to be have been formed by different geological processes, even though they're in the same very small contained area and yet they have so they were all identified as as individually strange or individually not fitting the natural background and then they have these kinds of ratios and relationships to each other and there are people that want you to think that that's random it's just a random accident or that you know we're no imposing way. our own um we're imposing our our own you know hopes or something on these things and it just it's just nonsense i mean no way no come way. on you know I, I this mean, stuff is look at giza in cairo i mean look at the pyramid complexes there i mean there's the three bell stars of orion you know you got the pyramid right. geometry you got mathematical layouts you know we've got mathematics encoded in our own pyramids here you know a lot a lot of no, granted a lot of egyptologists don't want to touch that they don't want to even accept that um, mm -hmm. i think a lot of people who have any sort of a technical know-how can accept that i mean even the angles that our own pyramids are built at are extremely difficult we have the bent pyramid incredibly hard to do as an engineering complex um you know and then we have this stuff here yeah different types like pentagonal pyramids you know but 
the angles that right. they're all they're not, yeah it's slightly different the theme but the theme is there it's a pyramid complex it well looks if like... you want to see if you want to see a bet pyramid on mars go go to the new folder the ancient aliens on mars 2 folder and mm-hmm. go take a look in there and there is <laughs> wow a pyramid um that's it's in the book and there's a picture of a pyramid that was taken from the uh, curiosity rover Mm-hmm. shortly after landing and it appears to be a pretty dang close match for the bent pyramid in wow. uh, in dasher so um you know i put wow. them up right side by side and you can judge for yourself wow. but they are and interestingly enough these pictures these early pictures when this, they were very far away even when the curiosity rover was a lot closer the images of that pyramid came out blurrier and blurrier as time went by it's almost as if Deliberate? they didn't really want yeah. you to Good look at it. Yeah. Yeah, of course, they did the flyover again of the face on Mars a second time, and it, it looks like it was Photoshopped to not look like it was. Well, no, a- they've done it. They've done it now. There's, there's, oh, geez, at least 15, 16 different pictures of the face on Mars from different spacecraft. And, yeah, that, that second one that was done in 1998, the, the so-called cat box version, uh, which I discuss a lot of ancient aliens on Mars, that was deliberately... It was taken deliberately under the worst possible conditions. Mm-hmm. Not only that, they deleted 50% of the data in the image to make it even, you know, less con- to create even less contrast, create mm-hmm. more artifacts in the data. They shot it from the worst possible angle, and they did that deliberately because we found out later, you know, Malin claimed, "Well, that we were just lucky. That was the best shot we could get of the thing." And we found out later that they had a targeting software where you could pick any target easily the size of the face on Mars anytime you wanted and click on it and, and when it passed over it it would just boom just n- absolutely nail that they had software that would program the thing to take the picture at the exact perfect time so they did that deliberately and you know there's even people that think that that um, the Mars Observer the spacecraft that was lost in the early 1990s was never really lost and that they actually used it because it had the same camera as the Mars Global Surveyor camera they actually used it to take test pictures and find out how could they take pictures of this area and make them look as bad as possible? Yeah. So that's one theory now. Whether mm-hmm. I don't really subscribe to that necessarily, but mm-hmm. you know, after years and years of this, there's not a lot that I put past anybody at NASA. To tell sure. you the truth, there's not a lot I put past them. For sure. Um, you know, this this really goes in the face of anything to do with Darwin. Darwin is is up against it these days uh, on many counts. Um, I mean, I actually feel sorry for Darwin because he he was in a race to publish his his work when he did. Uh, he was never happy with it. He had reservations about his own work, and and it's like I think that in the last hundred years, Mike, that this Darwinian debate as it's come back to it's really kind of not acceptable anymore i think we've been tampered with i think we've been altered i think we've yeah you know i'm open to that i think a lot more people are open to this now mike um and 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 if that's the case i mean darwin's you know it's failing on so many counts but this is like you know why not build some structures or two when you're tampering with another species like you know it all adds in together yeah. You know, John Anthony West calls it the Darwinian delusion. And I think it's <laughs> it's pretty clear at this point that, you know, we did not um, we did not evolve from apes. I mean, they still don't have any transitional species. Like you said, all, all of the, the all of the, the um, requirements that Darwin himself set out for his theory to be proven correct have not none of them have been met at this point. And yeah. he basically said, if we don't find transitional species, you know, if we don't find a half man, half lizard Mm-hmm. skeleton somewhere you know within the next 50 years at the rate we're finding fossils then we have to assume the theory is not correct and yet here we are 100 120 130 years later after darwin and still you know the scientific materialists are still clinging to this darwinian idea of everything just happened by accident and i think pretty obviously there's some there's intent in the design of our bodies there's all kinds of reasons to argue that there's intent in um in our in in our creation and our intelligence and it wasn't you know it wasn't just some random accident of nature so mm-hmm. like you say darwin's really up against it and i think that's another reason why they fight so hard against this kind of information getting out like ancient aliens the ancient alien theory ancient aliens on mars because they don't want people to start realizing that there's something bigger than them out there sure. and I, I think, think that's deeply deeply frightening yeah. to the 
John, John's, he, John's been on the show. John Anthony has been on the show twice. He's an awesome guy, and I love his uh, linguistic skill set uh, for for labeling things. It's 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 perfect. Um, but yeah, you mean the Darwinian delusion, as you say. Um, you know, in the last hundred years, Michael. I mean, we've had some strange and interesting things happen. We've had discovery after discovery. I think science is now caught up with everything, Mike. It it, it, it the problem is the science is. Is that a uh, is that a parallel with discovery? You know, and we're discovering stuff through science, and it may be, you know, genetically. I think we we're not supposed to exist past two hundred thousand years ago because the genetic mistakes don't add up past two hundred thousand years, and you know, it's like it's like we even that even geneticists don't want to face that because that faces the Darwinian problem, and it's like science is time and time again meeting this question head on. Um, I, I guess well, science. You know, yeah. look. So, I mean, again, I agree with you. The science is out there. This is what the choice was really about. Is the science is out there. The problem is, is that the scientific establishment will not acknowledge or recognize the science that's out there. The stuff that doesn't fit their pet theories, mm. they cast aside and ridicule and ignore. Mm. And that's the problem. The problem is, is that we are too dependent on scientists, putting mm. quotes around it, scientists. Mm. For our science, we're just way too dependent on scientists for our science. Mm. And uh, unfortunately, what's going to have to happen before we really can change anything is we're going to have to start thinking for ourselves, analyzing stuff um, in in greater depth on our own, mm -hmm. and um, and and you know making our own conclusions and trusting our own intuitions on these things. For sure, for sure. I have to ask you about these tubular structures, Michael. These things. Uh... I was looking at pictures of these tubes on Mars. Is this an underground system, a train line, a tunnel system? What? It clearly looks like some sort of a tunnel system, Mike. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know what that is um, exactly. It, it could be a tunnel system. It's uh, the argument has raged over whether this is a tunnel system or whether it's something else. And the bottom line is that, you know, you look at these images, there have been some MRO images, the, the scientific materialists, all they've got, guys like, like Dr. Phil, Phil Plate, who is the biggest douche on the planet as far as I'm concerned, <laughs> all, all they have for an argument is that, oh, it's not, con it's not convex, it's concave. It's an optical illusion. You're not really seeing these tubes. And then he tried to claim that the really bright reflection there which is obviously like glinting off of glass or metal or ice, possibly, mm -hmm. was uh, was just an optical illusion created by you know contrast enhancement. And then, of course, MRO pictures came out, and the same thing was glowing in the same way. So, y it looks to me like you've got some sort of a tubular structure transportation system. And these white, bright objects are not sand dunes; they actually appear to be, um, you know, structural. Uh, supports of some kind wrapped around this and it could have been you know we could be looking at really Lowell's canals these could be the ancient Martian canal builders that really did try to get water um, mm -hmm. to different parts of the planet that were lacking it that's exactly what we could be looking at and uh, you know I, I don't know I think there's something very interesting worth investigating but mm -hmm. it you know to me they're they're quite extraordinary Wow it totally, yeah. I mean, again, it just beggars belief that there's all these anomalies, and it's like there's all these techno bubble answers uh, engineered to explain it away. It's, it's some sort of a technical language, uh, extraordinary technical, you know, lingu um, terms and language to explain it all away. Like, you know, and it's, you know, it, it's not right. I think there's a lot of ignorance, Michael. There's a lot of ignorance. Um, I think these tubes, though, are one of the exciting things to be researched because they're, they're quite big, aren't they, Mike? They, they, they span quite a distance. Yeah, you could get a railroad car inside those, and they go for miles and miles. And, you know, they, they appear to go on, uh, rise up out of the, the ground and then go back down under it again. And it looks like you just got a rift there where something is just the, the sort of the skin of the planet is ripped apart. And also, if you go back and look at some of the photos of Sidonia and you look at... Um, at uh, things like um, the fortress, the so-called fort, which I dig into in this book a little bit in some detail that it hasn't been looked at before. What you see there is that there's another one of those types of tubes in a trench that's coming out from the fort, and, and in the infrared, which actually has some ground penetration capability, what you see is that that tube goes out of the fort, and then it goes under the ground for miles and miles and miles and miles across, almost all the way over to the face on Mars. So it looks like it could be some sort of um, 
subsurface transportation system that's been just exposed by the um, you know by the by the years and years of uh, of erosion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow, Michael, we're going to wrap it up soon, and uh, we're just at the end of the show. Um, I got to ask you: you got a conference coming up, I believe. Uh, Contact in the desert that's coming up soon. Yeah, and in Joshua Tree, California. If you're out in the states, you know, if you have a chance to come out, there's a. It's going to be a great event. It's at the Joshua Tree Retreat Center, and it's called Contact in the Desert. And you know, I'm going to be there. Eric Von Daniken is going to be there. Wow. Giorgio from Ancient Aliens is going to be there. My buddy Jason Martell is going to be there. Um, all of the really important people in the UFO community are going to be there, and it's going to be four days of lectures and uh, and stuff. And, it, and you know, it's a really got a great amphitheater where they, you can present all the information. And uh, it's near Palm Springs, California. Beautiful. So if you have an idea where that is, it's near there. And I really, you know, hope everybody comes out and has a really good time. And I'm gonna. I hope blow your brains out with uh, with the new pictures I have because I'm really excited about some wow. of them. Uh, again, Michael, the the website is mikebarrett.blogspot.com. They can catch the links to all your books there, Michael, and the the web right. and the web Picasso uh, album there too. Again, love what you do. I love the genre of research that you're doing because there's not many people doing this, Mike. You know, and it's. Uh, Again, you're in the driving seat and you're pursuing this and, and you're turning up more stuff. And it's like, you know, sometimes it's a commitment of research that that, that turns up this stuff. And I, again, I thank you for what you're doing. Um, uh, you know, any philosophical thing you want to end on, Mike? I mean, do you see this as uh, a paradigm that's going to, you know, continue to be changed? Do you think there's more people waking up to this reality? Do you think there's, you know, you know NASA's going to win the end game here and control the whole thing? or? Well, I think that I don't think that they're going to be able to win. I think people are going to wake up slowly but surely. I, I really think that what we need is we need more and more people that are fascinated by this to start looking. I mean, the fact is there's so many pictures on the web from all the different space probes on Mars and on the moon that, frankly, one person or two people don't have time to look at everything. And what I what I really encourage everybody to do is if you're interested in this stuff, go look for stuff. Go look for something mm -hmm. and find it and put it out there and let other people know about it and you know, start your own message board and, and do these kinds of things because the fact is a lot of this stuff, uh, and, I, and I try to give full credit to everybody who, who found stuff, there's a lot of these discoveries that I'm bringing up in this book that were found by other people first, and I want to make sure that they get full credit for having looked at this. But you know, there's extraordinary stuff on these images, not just mechanical things, but what mm -hmm. looks like skulls and dinosaur bones <laughs> and things that just, you know, do not, they defy explanation. Mm -hmm. And the reality is, is that this truth, whatever it is, is, uh, it's, it's all of our birthright, not mm -hmm. just a few of us, not just a few researchers. So the more people that get involved in this and do it themselves, the more discoveries are going to be made and the harder it's going to be for the repressive types to keep this information from the general public. Wow, beautiful. Uh, are you still talking to Richard? Is Richard still going in the research these days? Or is he yeah, he still, he still does his own thing. Um, he's, you know, he and I have different working styles, so it's difficult. <laughs> Another, you know, I could pump out a book in three months. Yeah. It takes him three years. You know, it's a lot longer process with him. And yeah. uh, it's just, a, you know, he's doing his own thing. I'm doing my own thing. Yeah. We're reinforcing each other. Um, some of the things in the book he's found, a lot of the things I've found, other people have found other other bits of it. And, you know, he's just busy with him, his own projects right now. And, and, you know, I just, I guess I got impatient and wanted to keep talking about this stuff and keep bringing it up. And I also wanted to create a series of books that were, that were simpler, that, that were not as technical, that, that sure. the average person could understand what I was talking about. Wow. So. The job of an engineer to reduce the complexity for sure. Yeah, exactly. That's that's what I'm trying to do. And that skill, I mean, I've, that was really good training for me for this is to take really complex arguments and try to reduce them to their, their simplest form. And that's, I think that's, I, if, I had, if you had to ask me what's my best skill, that's probably it, is the ability to communicate really complex information in, in a simple way.
around the Rendlesham Forest or going to Roswell and finding nothing. We're actually, you know, finding solid stuff, and we try to emphasize on our show the, you know, the the actual finding of something mm-hmm. that that you can actually put to the test. Well, that's, that's some pretty that's serious science spectroscopy uh, analysis of metallurgy, uh, and you know, that's pretty mm-hmm. hard science, there, Michael. Yeah, it is. It is. You just it just doesn't. The thing is, it doesn't it matter. <laughs> it doesn't matter how many labs come back with the same result if nobody will, you know, um, if nobody will acknowledge it. And so, hopefully, what we can accomplish on the show is we can just go right around the scientific community that refuses to even consider this stuff and and just kind of shove it down their throats and go mm. straight to the public with it because sure. you know, that's what we're trying to do. And I think it's been. Um, it's been a real, it's been a real fun experience, and I hope it continues. Tell me about ancient aliens, and uh, have you been involved with that in the new episodes, or is that still going? Well, it's still going. There's going to be a season seven. There are other people that have shot some season seven. I have not shot any of mine yet, and honestly, I'm not free to do that until my other show gives a thumbs up or thumbs down on new episodes. If Uncovering mm-hmm. Aliens and Animal Planet say they want me for that show, then I can't do any other shows. So I have to kind of wait and see what they. Uh, what they come up with there, and uh, I, I was able to shoot a TV show for the Sci-Fi Channel about the Moon. It's called, um, I think it's called, uh, you know, uh, Ancient Mysteries of the Moon or something mm-hmm. like that. It's going to be shown here on the Sci-Fi wow, Channel. Wow, that's in the interesting. US. I don't know. Do you guys, do you guys have Sci-Fi? Yeah, we do. Shows? Yeah, it's do quite popular. a lot of the, it's actually free over here. We get a, a, a lot of free on some of the cable networks. Um, it's quite okay. a, yeah. We we get a lot of history sci-fi stuff as well as just sci-fi as well. Like you know. Right, but I mean the actual Sci-Fi Network. Yeah, That's yeah, we I get the thought. Sci-Fi Network here yeah, in okay. UK and Ireland. Okay, we have the so Sci-Fi. You should look for that on on July twentieth. Uh, they're going to be showing that. that wow, show. that's and interesting. I sat for some interviews for that. It should be should be pretty interesting. It's a lot of the stuff is right out of Ancient Aliens on the Moon, out of that book that I wrote. So oh. it, it uh, should cover that. And you know, again, with these things, you sit down and you do them, and you know, it's it's all about how they edit things and how they cut you. And exactly. You never know how it's going to turn out, but. Uh, the producer Bob Kiviat, I thought, did a really good job, uh, at least from my from my experience with him, and and hopefully, it, you know, will uh, it'll be a really interesting show, and it'll again push the discussion forward mm-hmm. and start bringing these kinds of ideas more into the mainstream, so we all don't feel like like we're the black sheep in the family because we're interested in this stuff. Uh-huh. There's a massive interesting in this in the general public now. Everybody from all walks of life, Michael. Uh, we know, and I, I don't mean technologies. I mean. You know, maybe we were able to move our move things with our minds or with other uh, capabilities that mm-hmm. we don't have anymore. Mm-hmm. We don't know. We'll never know. But the thing is, if you can find one artifact, one ruin, one piece of technology on the moon or on Mars, then you've proven the whole ancient alien thesis, at least in the context of somebody who was here before that had very advanced knowledge and very advanced technology and probably taught us everything we knew in the ancient, uh, you know, in the ancient world. Do you ever subscribe so, to the idea that... Um, that's why I'm fascinated by it. Michael, do you ever so, subscribe to the idea that we may have been evolved in the past and it may have been our stuff on the moon or Mars and that we wiped ourselves out? Yeah, that's actually my basic premise. And, you know, in, in my second book, in The Choice, I talk a lot about the the Hopi prophecies and some of the ancient writings of the, um, of the, Indo, Indo, um, the uh, Indian cultures, the mm-hmm. ancient cultures of uh, India and Pakistan in that area. And, and basically what the Hopis say, among other things, is that, you know, there have been these three previous worlds of man and that they've been almost as advanced, if not more advanced, than we are today. So it's sort of an, a, an Atlantis legend or an Atlantis myth that's right there in the Hopi prophecies. And they actually say that we, you know, we visited places like the moon and Mars before. Mm-hmm. And... That's the weird thing about it is because when you look at this technology, when you look at these ruins, these buildings, or this this glass stuff on the moon, I mean, it to me it looks like human. It looks like human technology. It yeah. looks like something we would build. It's not. It, it's not alien in the sense that the aesthetic isn't alien. It it looks exactly like what you know you or I as an engineer would design. If we're going to make yeah. a building, we probably make it look like this, and it it, it looks so familiar so close to the kinds of things that we build today only on a much larger scale and of course mm. if you have superior technology and and manufacturing techniques you're you're able to build things on a much larger scale I so think the, uh, that's the, the only difference that we see yeah the glass structures yeah. i think just for the public that, that aren't aware is you know glass is what some 
15, 20 times stronger on the moon. It's it's like another substance. It's so rigid and 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 a better. Yeah, it's it's it's. It's about as strong as steel in a lunar vacuum if it is made with no moisture in it. It's actually the moisture content of glass which weakens it and mm -hmm. makes it, you know, easily shattered with I guess in the states it would be a baseball, you know, if you throw a, throw a baseball at a glass window you're going to shatter it. But mm. that it's because there's water in in glass where Michael and, and it's pertinent to what we're going to talk about some of these artifacts structures on the on the moon and on Mars you know you've got that engineering eye Michael and, uh, and, and you've got that engineering consultant brain to look at this stuff from a, an educated perspective and say no this isn't random this is orderly this is you know this is your territory, Michael, and I see why you've done the the, the books in that manner. Uh, I can see why you've followed on from the moon and Mars and then Mars too. There's so much information and so many photographs being discovered daily. Um, so tell us a little bit about you, Michael, where you're at today with the TV stuff and the books. And of course, you've got your new book out and we'll have a little general conversation before we get into the nitty gritty. Okay, well, you know, I guess I, I, I really agree with you on that, that first point about this because, you know, you think about it and uh, most of the people that study these photographs of the moon or photographs of Mars, I mean, they're, they're actually planetary geologists. In other words, they're, they're rock doctors. And, you know, I'm not an architect, but I do have an engineering background, structural engineering background, and like a lot of other guys in this uh, in that uh, that career, I know structure when I see it, mm. and so when I look at these things, I can definitely see the signs of construction and intent and design intent, as opposed to you know somebody who studies rocks is not going to be able, they're not going to recognize that. They're going to try to come up with some ad hoc um, geologic explanation for stuff, and it really just doesn't fit for most of these things. You know, as you start digging into it deeper and deeper, you look at something like the face on Mars, for instance. It looks like a face from a long ways away. When you get up close, you see all sorts of structural detail on it, which is exactly what you'd expect if it was constructed as opposed to if it was just some sort of random geologic formation. I mean, you know, I like to joke that uh, since I'm, I'm out in Seattle right now, I like to joke that geologists can come up with a, a natural explanation for the space needle on Google Earth if they <laughs> had to to, make, to to claim it wasn't artificial, you know? Sure. So it's just... Um, as part, as part of the, my background, I mean, I grew up uh, in the Seattle area. I worked at Boeing for a decade and a half. I, I went on to other contract jobs, uh, worked for a lot of other companies internationally, and and then settled in in L.A. and um, started doing more things on the consulting side because it was – the cool thing about it is I didn't have to produce anything. You know, I, didn't, <laughs> I didn't have to actually build any parts, design anything. Wow. I could just sit back and tell other people what to do. So that was – that was the relaxing part of my career, you know, not to really have any deadlines. And, uh, and since then, you know, I've become very curious in all these, with all these different um, mysteries about UFOs and aliens and things. And I think what what's always caught my eye about these extraterrestrial artifacts is the fact that you can prove it out and you can point to things that are, you know, obviously structural. And you can, I think, kind of build a case that, that you've got some proof, whereas I don't think you can really prove alien abductions or or um, a lot of UFO videos are really hard to prove out. So sure. it's, you know, just, that's kind of the way I, I was attracted to this kind of stuff because it was more interesting and, and more solid, I thought. But having said that, you know, I'm involved in a new TV show called Uncovering Aliens. Oh, yeah. For the, the Animal Planet Network out here. And we're, we're doing investigations of, um, you know, UFO cases, sightings, and even abductions, and it's been a real eye-opener for me to, to have that experience and actually meet people that have gone through this stuff, because it, 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 it's hard to sit there and look at somebody and say, you know, you're lying, when they're obviously not lying, but something mm. really, really strange happened to them, and mm. I guess my job on the show is just to kind of make sure that, that we're asking all the questions that need to be asked before we sure. come to a conclusion. And it's different to UF hunters in a way than Michael. 
Uh, yeah, it, it is. It's you know the, the main thing that we try to focus on. We we shot four episodes initially, and we're still waiting to hear from the network. They've shown them over and over and over again. They've shown them overseas. I guess I guess we're big in Lithuania, is what I heard recently. <laughs> but uh, but they're showing them all over the place. But they haven't committed to new episodes yet. We're kind of hoping we're going to get, get a decision on that very soon and move forward. But it's it's more of a situation where we're actually doing personal you know cases, abduction cases. We had one case. We had one case where we actually uh, studied uh, a piece of metal that had been shot off of a UFO that was over a guy's house. And, and we did uh, an examination of it, and there's subsequently been two more lab tests. And it came back as a non-terrestrial manufactured aluminum alloy, meaning wow. it was made somewhere other than planet Earth. And so to me, what I like about our show is we're not just wandering around. Um, you know, did you see that coming? Were you a lone ranger for a while, Mike? Uh, pioneer in a way? Yeah, I think so. You know, I got really interested in doing stuff on artifacts and so forth, like in the early 1990s. But what really helped that was was the X Files, to be quite honest with you, because it was a you know very popular show, brought a lot of these memes and ideas into the cultural consciousness. And then when that sort of ran its course and faded away, we had a gap there of about 10 years. And and really, then along comes Ancient Aliens. Mm -hmm. And with Ancient Aliens, you have this this whole new audience of young people. The kids of those folks that watch the X Files are now grown up, and they're very curious about all this stuff. And they also don't, you know, they don't trust authority quite as much. So when some guy who has the word scientist under his name makes some statement, no matter how ridiculous it might be, you know, there's a, per a certain percentage of the population that just accepts that because he's an authority figure. Mm -hmm. And but these kids, the, the younger audience, they don't necessarily buy into it, and they keep asking questions. And and you know, fortunately, we're coming up with a lot of answers for them mm -hmm. that only, of course, open up new questions. Mm -hmm. So that's the process, and you just keep you just keep moving forward by asking the next question. Mm. Of course, I, I think, in fairness, Michael, what you do with the moon and the Mars stuff is 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 limited in terms of other researchers. I mean, there's not many people carry the flag for that one. Yourself, Richard Hogan, in, in fairness as well, and I know you've pioneered stuff with Michael, uh, with Richard as well, and I mean, I think a lot of people on Ancient Aliens, they all tap into their own genre, and that's fine, but I mean, not many people want to take this on in, in the manner that you have done, Michael. And when I first heard you talk on, I first heard you talk on Coast to Coast AM about the moon stuff, and I was like, wow, you know, it just pays off when you when you dedicate yourself into a research topic. You don't know what you're going to find till you're doing it. Um, and I think you have, you know, put this genre together because it is a genre of anomalies and mysteries. I, I, I sometimes don't know which one's more fascinating, Mars or the moon. It's like I seem to go between the two. Yeah. Yeah, um, they're both fascinating. And thanks for that. You know, the thing is, the ancient aliens question is is fascinating to a lot of people, and it should be, because there's all kinds of mysteries about the Earth and, and ruins and things that are here on Earth, and, and there's some question, you know, did they have the technology to build them? How did they how did they cut and move the 1,400-ton trilithon blocks at Baalbek? How yeah. is that stuff all done? Yeah. And, it you know, you don't, you don't know those things, but again, there, there could be technologies, there could be techniques, there could be things that we knew back then that we've lost now.